All right. Sorry about that. And sorry about the. S oh, wow. Okay. There we go. Sorry about the late delay. Um, long delay. Slow. Late start. Whatever. I don't have great command of the English language at this time. Um, <laughs> it's been a week, and it is going to keep being a week. So we're doing some more Fall of Hyperion, because this Friday's looking very dicey indeed. Um, so to preempt it, I am going to do the Hyperion reading today. So um, it is going to, by necessity, be a somewhat short one. For that, I apologize. Um, Things have been a little wild. Uh, things should stabilize, though, uh, come the start of next month with any luck. Um, so, we'll see. Um, so, previously on, we had a lot, a lot of things happened. Uh, so, first of all, uh, Braun Lamia and her um, sh formerly Shrone Looped copy of the cybrid recreation of John Keats and her lover, incidentally, um, went to see Keats's father. Well, the uh, father AI entity uh, known as Uman, who is the originator of the Keats uh, replicant. And um, we get something of a plot bomb, or two, or three. Uh, we knew a bunch about, you know, okay, yeah, the uh, there are three factions in the AIs. One of them is like, let's get rid of humanity. One of them is like, let's go for uh, making the ultimate intelligence and nothing else matters. And the other one is like, let's go for making the ultimate intelligence, but let's not kill humanity in the process. Thanks. That'd be cool. Um, we feel we sort of owe them a debt of creation. Um, but they made us, so we don't have to kill them. Um, well, it turns out things are a bit more complicated than that. Uh, mostly because, uh, at some point the robots definitely succeed. They do create their ultimate intelligence, and they know this because it has spoken with them. It has done things from the future, sent back in time, uh, to give them little pro tips, um, basically, little pointers. Um, however, it is yet more complicated by the fact that there is also a human ultimate intelligence, something descended from humanity, the ultimate human existence, which is uh, some triune, three-part, uh, Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost type affair. Um, and it turns out, and basically the AI UI, the machine UI, and the human UI have been locked in, uh, I guess, theoretically, infinite epochs of combat with each other, but the human UI decided it would be a good idea to send one-third of itself, the empathy portion of its existence, somewhere somewhere else. Some when else. Uh, so it has traveled back through time. We don't know who it is as yet, uh, but it has been sent back in time. Could it be Jesus? Could it be you? Could it be me? Who knows? Maybe we'll find out. Uh, the Shrike is somehow connected uh, to the machine UI um, and is, I guess, its avatar uh, sent back in time. But the human UI sent back another avatar as well to keep it in check. Um, basically, things are really complicated and um, uh, <laughs> things are wild. Uh, meanwhile, our boy guy whose name I've already forgotten. Excellent. Excellent. This is just... <sighs> the guy, the new Keats hybrid, <clears throat> who's going by a different name uh, that I can't remember right now because um, I'm an embarrassment. Uh, where are you? Where are you? What is your name, bro? 
Ah, yes, Joseph Severn. There we go, finally. Um, I only had to flip through half the book um, <laughs> to see a reference to his name. So Joseph Severn, meanwhile, uh, has traveled to Pacha, the uh, last bastion of uh, Catholicism. It's, it's where the remnants of Catholicism have largely ended up, uh, where they basically chill out because um, it's kind of a miserable place to live, uh, kind of arid or rainy. It's 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 not totally in anathema to human life, but it's 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 not ideal. Uh, but that's where they hang out. Um, and he's like, I'm going to go talk to the Pope because I've seen things you people wouldn't believe, and maybe he should know about some of them. Uh, because I've I have dreamed the whole um, UIs fighting in heaven thing, uh, gods fighting in heaven, uh, and uh, I, I think maybe the Catholic Church people should have some might have some insight on what to do next. Uh, they they do stuff like that, so of course, uh, so he goes there only to find that uh, our boy Paul Deray is there somehow. Uh, we learn how the somehow works uh, and how he got there, which basically met, uh, involved him walking through the local equivalent of a Hieronymus Bosch painting made real. Deeply, deeply unpleasant. Turns out all the uh, all the labyrinths on the labyrinthine worlds, uh, which date from possibly millions of years ago, uh, are all... torture dimensions, I guess. Uh, it's, they're abattoirs. There's lots of dead bodies there. Lots and lots of dead bodies um, that nobody usually sees because time shenanigans, I guess. Um, it's complicated. Um, we're not going to think too hard about it right now, but there will be some answers and revelations in the chapters to come. Maybe not today, but eventually. Um, there's stuff going on there. Suffice it to say, uh, there is a dark side to the labyrinths that was not uh, immediately clear before. Um, possibly it's it's got something to do with uh, the... So almost certainly it's got something to do with the uh, ultimate intelligences and their war, uh, but we don't know exactly what as yet. Um, so with that, I'm going to get cracking on chapter 35, I think we're up to now. Yes, chapter 35. Um, to anybody tuning in uh, now um, or uh, after the fact, uh, the reason it's a wordy Wednesday is because my week is busy and I'm not going to be able to do it on Friday. Uh, for anybody tuning in live, I probably will not be doing one on Friday. It does not look like I will be able to, but um, that's why we're doing it today. Uh, but I will be updating the playlists uh, this coming weekend. Um, so everything will at least make some sense and it'll be easy to find as opposed to the rat's nest that it currently is. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, get cracking and uh, this will again be somewhat short because um, my time is tight. But some new revelations are in the offing. Oh, geez, I only just now see that a bunch of you are on. Hello, Warren. Hello, Stacky Botris. Thank you for tuning in. Chapter 35. Confusion. 300 spacecraft retreating in hype. Oh, wait. Yes, I am doing it correctly. Very good. I thought so. I'm trying to keep track of the character perspective stuff. Uh, so the last chapter ended uh, with um, Paul DeRay and the current Pope, uh, Monsignor Edouard. I think he's... No, he is not current Pope. The current Pope is, I think, gone. 
Um, so the the previous pope is gone. So now it's uh, they don't know who's pope yet. Um, they're deciding who the pope is going to be. Uh, so at the end of the chapter, uh, Monsignor Edward and Father Paul de Ray told um, Joseph Severin slash John Keat, current iteration of the Keats cybrid, um, why don't you try doing a daydream to see what's going on? Seems like that's a good idea, so we can know what's going on, you know? Yes, that would be a good idea. So chapter 35, Confusion. 300 spacecraft retreating in Hyperion space under heavy fire, falling back from the swarm like men fighting bees. Madness near the military farcaster portals, traffic control overloaded, ships backed up like EMVs in TC Squared's airborne gridlock, vulnerable as partridges to the roaming ouster assault ships. Madness at the exit points. Force spacecraft lined up like sheep in a narrow pen as they cycle from the Mudya cutoff portal to the outgoing caster. Ships spinning down into Hebron space, a few translating to Heaven's Gate, God's Grove, Mare Infinitus, Asquith. Only hours left now before the swarms enter web systems. Confusion as hundreds of millions of refugees far cast away from the threatened worlds, stepping into cities and relocation centers gone half mad with the aimless excitement of incipient war. Confusion as unthreatened web worlds ignite with riots. Three hives on Lucis, almost 70 million citizens, that's 770 million citizens, quarantined due to Shrike cult riots, 30 level malls looted, apartment monoliths overrun by mobs, fusion centers blown, Farcaster Terminexes under attack. The Home Rule Council appeals to the hegemony. The hegemony declares martial law and sends force marines to seal the hives. Secessionist riots on New Earth and Maui Covenant. Terrorist attacks from Glennon Height royalists. Quiet now for three quarters of a century. On Thalia, Armagast, Nordholm, and, and Lee Three. More Shrike cult riots on Tsingdao, Shishuang Panna, and Renaissance Vector. Do you have any idea how hard it is to transition between the name of that planet and the name of Renaissance Vector? That is many syllables in a, in a language I'm not accustomed to pronouncing, followed immediately by English words. Well, Latin ones, anyway. <laughs> More Shrike cult riots on Tsingdao, Shishuang Panna, and Renaissance Vector. Force Command on Olympus transfers combat battalions from transports returning from Hyperion to web worlds. Demolition squads assigned to torch ships and threatened systems report Farcaster Singularity Spheres wired for destruction, awaiting only the fat-lined order from TC Squared. There is a better way, Councillor Albedo tells Gladstone and the War Council. The CEO turns toward the ambassador from the Technocore. There is a weapon that will eliminate the ousters without harming hegemony property, or ouster property, for that matter. General Morpurgo glowers. You're talking about the bomb equivalent of a death wand he says. It won't work. Force researchers have shown that it propagates indefinitely. Besides being dishonorable against the new Bushido code, it would wipe out planetary populations as well as the invaders. Not at all, says Albedo. If hegemony citizens are properly shielded, there need be no casualties whatsoever. As you know, death wands can be calibrated for specific cerebral wavelengths. So could a bomb based on the same principle. Livestock, wild animals, even other anthropoid species would not be affected. General Van Zyt of Force Marines stands. But there's no way to shield a population. Our testing showed that death bomb heavy neutrinos would penetrate solid rock or metal to a depth of six kilometers. No one has shelters like that. The projection of Councillor Albedo folds his hands on the table. 
We have nine worlds with shelters which would hold billions, he says softly. Gladstone nods. The labyrinthine worlds, she whispers, but certainly such a transfer of population would be impossible. No, says Albedo. Now that you have joined Hyperion to the Protectorate, each of the labyrinthine worlds has Farcaster capability. The Corps can make arrangements to transfer populations directly to these underground shelters. There is babble around the long table, but Mena Gladstone's intense gaze never leaves Albedo's face. She beckons for silence and receives it. Tell us more, she says. We are interested. The consul sits in the spotty shade of a low neville tree and waits to die. His hands are tied behind him with a twist of fiber plastic. His clothes are torn to rags and are still damp. The moisture on his face is partially from the river, but mostly from perspiration. The two men who stand over him are finishing their inspection of his duffel bag. Shit, says the first man. There be nothing worth anything herein except this fucking antique pistol. He thrusts Braun Lamia's father's weapon in his belt. It be too bad we couldn't get that goddamn frying carpet says the second man. It bain't flying too well there toward the end, says the first man, and both of them laugh. <laughs> the consul squints at the two massive figures, their armored bodies made silhouettes by the lowering sun. From their dialect, he assumes them to be indigenes. From their appearance, bits of outmoded force body armor, heavy multi-purpose assault rifles, tatters of what once had been camo-polymer cloth, he guesses them to be deserters from some Hyperion self-defense force unit. From their behavior toward him, he is sure that they are going to kill him. At first, stunned from the fall into the Hooley River, still tangled in the ropes connecting him to his duffel bag and the useless hawking mat, he thought them to be his saviors. The consul had hit the water hard, stayed under for a much longer time than he would have imagined possible without drowning, and surfaced only to be pushed under by a strong current and then pulled under again by the tangle of ropes and mat. It had been a valiant but losing battle, and he was still ten meters from the shallows when one of the men emerging from the Neville and Thorn Tree Forest had thrown, a, had thrown the consul a line. Then they had beaten him, robbed him, tied him, and, judging from their matter-of-fact comments, were now preparing to cut his throat and leave him for the Harbinger Birds. The taller of the two men, his hair a mass of oiled spikes, squats in front of the console, and pulls a ceramic zero-edge knife from its scabbard. Any last words, pops? The console licks his lips. He has seen a thousand movies and holies where this was the point at which the hero twisted his opponent's legs out from under him, kicked the other one into submission, seized a weapon, and dispatched both firing with his hands still tied, and then went on with his adventures. But the consul feels like no hero. He is exhausted and middle-aged and hurt from his fall in the river. Each of these men is leaner, stronger, faster, and obviously meaner than the consul has ever been. He has seen violence, even committed violence once, but his life and training have been devoted to the tense but quiet paths of diplomacy. The consul licks his lips again and says, I can pay you. The crouching man smiles and moves the zero-edge blade back and forth five centimeters in front of the consul's eyes. With what, pups? We've got your universal card and they be worth shit out here. Gold, says the consul knowing that this is the only syllable that has held its power over the ages. The crouching man does not react. There is a sick light in his eyes as he watches the blade, but the other man steps forward and sets a heavy hand on his partner's shoulder. 
What be you talking about, man? Wherefore you got gold? My ship, says the consul. The Benares. The crouching man raises the blade next to his own cheek. He be lying, Chase. The Benares be that old flat bottom manta pulled barge belonging to the Blueskins we finished three days ago. The consul closes his eyes for a second, feeling the nausea in him, but not surrendering to it. A. Betic and the other android crewmen had left the Benares in one of the ship's launches less than a week earlier, heading downstream toward freedom. Evidently, they had found something else. A. Betic, he says, the crew captain, he didn't mention the gold? The man with the knife grins. He makes a lot of, he make lots of noise, but he don't speak much. He say the boat way and the shit got up to age. Oh, I see. He say the boat way and the shit got up to age. Too fucking far for a barge with no matters, me think. Shut up, Obin. The other man crouches in front of con on in front of the console. Why would you have gold on that old barge, man? The console raises his face. Don't you recognize me? I was a Gemini consul to Hyperion for years. I don't be fucking with us, begins the man with the knife, but the other interrupts. Yeah, man, I remember your face on the camp only when I, when I be kid-like. So why are you carrying gold up river now when the sky be foreign, head Gemini man? We were heading for the shelter, Kronos Keep says the consul, trying not to sound too eager, but at the same time grateful for each second he's allowed to live. Why, part of them thinks, you were tired of living, ready to die. Not like this. Not while Saul and Rachel and the others need his help. Several of Hyperion's most wealthy citizens, he says, the evacuation authorities wouldn't allow them to transfer the bullion, so I agreed to help them store it in vaults in Kronos Keep, the old castle north of Bridal Range, for a commission. You be fucking crazy, sneers the man with the knife. Everything north of here be shrot country now. The consul lowers his head. There is no need to simulate the fatigue and sense of defeat he projects. So we discovered. The android crew deserted last week. Several of the passengers were killed by the Shrike. I was coming down river by myself. This be shit, says the man with the knife. His eyes have that sick, distracted look again. Not a second, says his partner. He slaps the console once, hard. So where by this so-called gold ship, old man? The consul tastes blood. Up river. Not on the river, but hidden in one of the tributaries. Yeah, says the knife man, setting the zero-edge blade flat against the side of the consul's neck. He will not need to slash in order to sever the consul's throat, merely rotate the blade. I say this be shit, and I say we be wasting time. Just a second snaps the other man. How far up river? The consul thinks of the tributaries he has passed in the last few hours. It is late. The sun almost touches the line of a copse of trees to the west. Just above Carla Lux, he says. So why you be flying down on that toy like rather than barging it? Trying to get help, says the consul. The adrenaline has faded, and now he feels a terminal exhaustion very close to despair. There were too many, too many bandits along the shore. The barge seemed too risky. The hawking mat was safer. The man called Chez laughs. Put the knife away, Obim. We be walking it up a bit, eh? Obem leaps to his feet. The knife is still in his hand, but now the blade, and the anger, are aimed toward his partner. 
Be you fucked, man, eh? Be your head full of sh- be, be your head be full of shit between ears, eh? He be lying to keep from death wards flying. Chez neither blinks nor steps back. Sure, he might, he be may be lying. Don't matter, eh? The locks they be less enough day walk we be making anyway, eh? No boat, no gold, you got his throat, eh? Only slow wise, ankles up like. They be gold, you still gets the job, blade wise. Only be rich man now, eh? Obem teeters a second between rage and reason, turns to the side, and swings the ceramic zero-edge blade at a Neville tree eight centimeters thick through the trunk. He has time to turn back and crouch in front of the console before gravity informs the tree that it has been severed, and the Neville falls back toward the river's edge with a crash of branches. Obem grabs the console's still damp shirt front. Okay, we see what be there, hegemony man. Talk, run, trip, stumble, and I be slossing fingers and ears just for practice, eh? The consul staggers to his feet, and the three of them move back into the cover of brush and low trees, the consul three meters behind Chez and the same distance in front of Obem, trudging the back the way he had come, moving away from the city and the ship and any chance of saving Saul and Rachel. An hour passes. The consul can think of no clever scheme once the tributaries are reached, the barge not discovered. Several times, Chez waves them into silence and hiding, once at the sound of gossamers fluttering in branches, again at a disturbance across the river, but there is no sign of other human beings. No sign of help. The consul remembers the burned-out buildings along the river, the empty huts and vacant wharves. Fear of the Shrike, fear of being left behind to the ousters in the evacuation, and months of plundering by rogue elements of the SDF, have turned this area into a no-man's land. The consul concocts excuses and extensions, then discards them. His only hope is that they will walk close to the locks where he can make a leap for the deep and rapid water there, try to stay afloat with his hands tied behind him until he is hidden in the maze of small islands below that point. Except that he is too tired to swim, even if his arms were free. And the weapons the two men carry would target him easily, even if he had a ten-minute start among the snags and isles. The consul is too tired to be clever, too old to be brave. He thinks about his wife and son, dead these many years now, killed in the bombing of Brescia by men with no more honor than these two creatures. The consul is only sorry that he has broken his word to help the other pilgrims. Sorry about that, and that he will not see how it all comes out. Obem makes a spitting noise behind him. Shit with this, Chez, eh? What say we sit him and slit him and help him talk a bit, eh? Then we go lone wise to the barge, if barge they be. Chez turns, rubs sweat out of his eyes, frowns at the consul speculatively, and says, Ah, hey, yeah, I think maybe time-wise and quiet-wise you be right, Goyo, but leave it talkable toward the end, eh? Sure, grins Obem, slinging his weapon and extracting his zero edge. Do not move, booms a voice from above. The consul drops to his knees, and the ex-SDF bandits use unsling weapons with practiced swiftness. There is a rush, a roar, a whipping of branches and dust about them, and the consul, ups, the consul looks up in time to see a rippling of the cloud-covered evening sky, lower than the clouds, a sense of mass directly above, descending, and then Chez is lifting his flechette rifle, and Obem is targeting his launcher, and then all three are falling, pitching over, not like soldiers shot, not like... Wait, all three? 
Anyway, and then all three are falling, pitching over, not like soldiers shot, not like recoil elements in some ballistic equation, but dropping like the tree Obem had felled earlier on. I guess there were three of them. <laughs> I thought there were only two. Oops. The console lands face first in dust and gravel and lies there unblinking, unable to blink. Oh, and lies there unable, uh, and lies there unblinking, unable to blink. Oh, I guess the third is the console. I'm dumb. I'm really not in a fit mental state at the moment. Sorry. Stun weapon, he thinks, through synapses gone sluggish as old oil. A localized cyclone erupts as something large and invisible lands between the three bodies in the dust and the river's edge. The console hears a hatch whine open, and the internal tick of repeller turbines dropping below lift critical. He still cannot blink, much, left, much less lift his head, and his vision is limited to several pebbles, a dunescape of sand, a small grass forest, and a single architect ant, huge at this distance, that seems to be taking a sudden interest in the console's moist but unblinking eye. The ant turns to hurry the half-meter between itself and its moist prize, and the console thinks, hurry, at the unhurried footsteps behind him. Hands under his arms, grunting, a familiar but strained voice saying, Damn, you've put on weight. The console's heels drag in the dirt, bouncing over the randomly twitching fingers of Chez. Or perhaps it is Obem. The console cannot turn his head to see their faces. Nor can he see his rescuer until he is lifted, with a grunted litany of soft curses near his ear. Through the starboard blister hatch of the decamouflaged skimmer into the long, soft leather of the reclining passenger seat. Governor General Theo Lane appears in the consul's field of vision, boyish looking but slightly demonic looking, too, as the hatch lowers and the red interior lamps light his face. The younger man leans over to secure crash web snaps across the consul's chest. I'm sorry I had to stun you along with the along with those other two. Theo sits back, snaps his own web in place, and twitches the omni controller. The consul feels the skimmer shiver and then lift off, hovering a second before spinning left like a plate on frictionless bearings. Acceleration pushes the consul into his seat. I didn't have much choice, says Theo over the soft internal skimmer noises. The only weapon these things are allowed to carry are the riot control stunners, and the easiest way was to drop all three of you at the lowest setting and get you out of there fast. Theo pushes his archaic glasses higher on his nose, with a familiar twitch of one finger, and turns to grin at the consul. Old mercenary proverb, kill em all and let God sort em out. The consul manages to move his tongue enough to make a sound, and drool a bit on his cheek and the seat leather. Relax a minute says Theo, returning his attention to the instruments and view outside. Two or three minutes and you should be talking all right. I'm staying low, flying slow, so it's about a ten-minute ride back to Keats. Theo glances toward his passenger. You're lucky, sir. You must have been dehydrated. Those other two wet their pants when they went down. Humane weapon, the stunner, but embarrassing if you don't have a change of pants around. The consul tries to express his opinion of this humane weapon. Another couple of minutes, sir, says Governor General Theo Lane, reaching over to dab at the consul's cheek with a handkerchief. I should warn you, it's a mite uncomfortable when the stun begins to wear off. At that moment, someone inserts several thousand pins and needles in the consul's body. How the hell did you find me? asks the consul. They are a few kilometers above the city, still flying over the Huli River. 
He is able to sit up, and his words are more or less intelligible, but the consul, but the consul is glad that he has several more minutes before he will have to stand or walk. What, sir? I said, how did you find me? How could you possibly know that I'd come back down the hooli? CEO Gladstone fatlined me, eyes only on the old consulate one-time pad. Gladstone? The consul is shaking his hands, trying to agitate feeling back into fingers as useful as rubber sausages. How the hell could Gladstone possibly know that I was in trouble on the Hooli River? I left Grandmother Ceres' comlog receiver back in the valley so I could l call the other pilgrims when I got to the ship. How could Gladstone know? I don't know, sir, but she specified your location and that you were in trouble. She even said you'd be fly you'd been flying a hawking mat that went down. The consul shakes his head. This lady has resources we hadn't dreamt of, Theo. Yes, sir. The consul glances at his friend. Theo Lane had been governor general of the new protectorate world of Hyperion for over a local year now, but old habits died hard, and the sir came from the seven years Theo had served as vice consul and principal aide during the consul during the consul's years. <laughs> the last time he had seen the young man, not so young now, as the consul realizes, responsibility has brought lines and wrinkles to that young face. Theo had been furious that the consul would not take over the governor generalship. That had been a little more than a week ago. Ages and eons ago. By the way, says the consul, enunciating each word carefully. Thank you, Theo. The governor general nods, apparently lost in thought. He does not ask about what the consul has seen north of the mountains, nor the fate of the other pilgrims. Beneath them, the Huli widens and winds toward the capital of Keats. Far back on either side, low bluffs rise, their granite slabs glowing softly in the evening light. Stands of everblues shimmer in the breeze. Theo, how did you possibly have time to come for me yourself? The situation on Hyperion must be pure madness. It is. Theo ordered the autopilot to take over as he turned to look at the consul. It's a matter of hours, perhaps minutes, before the ousters actually invade. The consul blinked. Invade? You mean land? Exactly. But the hegemony fleet is in total chaos. They were barely holding their own against the swarm before the web invaded. The before the web was invaded, sorry, the web, entire systems fallen, others threatened. Force has ordered the fleet back through their military forecasters, but evidently the ship's, sis the ship's in system have found it hard to disengage. No one gives me details, but it's obvious that the ousters have free reign everywhere except for the defensive perimeter forces put up around the singularity spheres and the portals. The spaceport? The consul thinks of his beautiful ship lying as glowing wreckage. It hasn't been attacked yet, but Force has been pulling its dropships and supply craft out as quickly as they can. They've left a skeleton force of marines behind. What about the evacuation? Theo laughed. It was the most bitter sound the consul had ever heard from the young man. The evacuation will consist of whatever consulate people and hegemony VIPs can fit on the last dropship out. They've given up trying to save the people of Hyperion? Sir, they can't even save their own people. Word trickling down through the ambassador's fat line says that Gladstone has decided to let the threatened web worlds fall so that Force can regroup, have a couple of years to create defenses while the swarms accrue time debt. My God, whispers the consul. He had worked most of his life to represent the hegemony, all the while plotting its downfall in order to avenge his grandmother, his grandmother's way of life. But now the thought of it actually happening. What about the Shrike? he asks suddenly, seeing the low white buildings of Keats a few kilometers ahead. Sunlight touches the hills and river like a final benediction before darkness. Theo shakes his head. 
There are still reports, but the Ousters have taken over as the primary source of panic. But it's not in the web. The Shrike, I mean. The Governor General gives the Consul a sharp look. In the web? How could it be in the web? They still haven't allowed Farcaster portals on Hyperion. And there have been no sightings near Keats or Endymion or Port Romance. None of the larger cities. The Consul says nothing, but he is thinking, My God, my betrayal was for nothing. I sold my soul to, the time, to open the time tombs, and the Shrike will not be the cause of the web's fall. The ousters. They were wise to us all along. My betrayal of the hegemony was part of their plan. Listen, Theo says harshly, gripping the consul's wrist. There's a reason Gladstone had me leave everything to find you. She's authorized the release of your ship. Wonderful, says the consul. I can... Listen, you're not to go back to the Valley of the Time Tombs. Gladstone wants you to avoid the force perimeter and travel in system until you contact elements of the swarm. The swarm? Why would... The CEO wants you to negotiate with them. They know you. Somehow she's managed to let them know that you're coming. She thinks that they'll let you, that they won't destroy your ship. But she hasn't received confirmation of that. It'll be risky. The consul sits back in the leather seat. He feels as if he has been hit by the neural stunner again. Negotiate? What the hell would I have to negotiate? Negotiate? What the hell would I have to negotiate? Gladstone said that she would contact you via your ship's fat line once you're off Hyperion. This has to be done quickly. Today, before all the first wave worlds fall to the swarms. The Consul hears First Wave Worlds, but does not ask if his beloved Maui Covenant is amongst them. Perhaps, he thinks, it would be best if it were. He says, No, I'm going back to the valley. Theo adjusts his glasses. She won't allow that, sir. Oh, the Consul smiles. How's she gonna stop me? Shoot down my ship? I don't know, but she said that she wouldn't allow it. Theo sounds sincerely worried. The Force Fleet does have picket ships and torch ships in orbit, sir, to escort the last drop ships. Well, says the Consul, still smiling, let them try to shoot me down. Manned ships haven't been able to land near the Valley of the Time Tombs for two centuries anyway. Ships land perfectly, but their crews disappear. Before they slag me, I'll be hanging on th I'll be hanging on the Shrike's tree. The Consul closes his eyes a moment and imagines the ship landing, empty, on the plain above the valley. He imagines Saul, Duray, and the others, miraculously returned, running for shelter in the ship, using its surgery to save Het Mastine and Braun Lamia, using its cryogenic fugue and sleep chambers to save little Rachel. "'My God!' whispers Theo, and the shocked tone slams the Consul out of, her, out of his reverie. They have come around the final turn in the river above the city. The bluffs rise higher here, culminating to the south in the carved mountain likeness of Sad King Billy. The sun is just setting, igniting low clouds and buildings high on the eastern bluffs. Above the city, a battle is raging. Lasers lance into and through the clouds, ships dodge like gnats and burn like moths too close to a flame, while parafoils and the blur of suspension fields dr drift beneath the cloud ceiling. The city of Keats is being attacked. The ousters have come to Hyperion. Oh, sweet fuck, Theo whispers reverently. Along the forested ridge northwest of the city, a brief spout of flame and a flicker of contrail mark a shoulder-launched rocket coming directly toward the hegemony skimmer. Hang on! snaps Theo. He takes manual control, throws switches, banks the skimmer steeply to starboard, trying to turn inside the small rocket's own turning radius. 
An explosion aft throws the console into the crash web and blurs his vision for a moment. When he can focus again, the cabin is filled with smoke, red warning lights pulse through the gloom, and the skimmer warns of systems failure in a dozen urgent voices. Theo is slumped grimly over the Omni-controller. Hang on, he says again, needlessly. The skimmer slews sickeningly, finds a grip in the air, and then loses it as they tumble and sideslip toward the burning city. Chapter 36 I blinked and opened my eyes, disoriented for a second as I looked around the immense, dark space of St. Peter's Basilica. Pacem. Monsignor Edouard and Father Paul Duray leaned forward in the dim candlelight, their expressions intense. How long was I asleep? I felt as if only seconds had elapsed, the dream of a shimmer of, the dream a shimmer of images one has in the instants between lying peacefully and full sleep. Ten minutes, says the Monsignor. Can you tell us what you saw? I saw no reason not to. When I was finished describing the images, Monsignor Edouard crossed himself. Mon Dieu, the ambassador from the Techno Corps urges Gladstone to send people to those tunnels. Duray touched my shoulder. After I talk to the true voice of the world tree on God's Grove, I will join you on TC Squared. We have to tell Gladstone of the folly of such a choice. I nodded. All thoughts of my going to God's Grove with Duray, or to Hyperion itself, had fled. I agree. We should depart at once. Is your... Can the Pope's door take me to Tau Ceti Centre? The Monsignor stood, nodded, stretched. Suddenly I realised that he was a very old man, untouched by Paulson treatments. "'It has priority access,' he said. He turned to Duray. "'Paul, you know that I would accompany you if I could. The funeral of his holiness, the election of a new holy father!' Monsignor Edouard made a small, rueful sound. Oh, how the daily imperatives persist, even in the face of collective disaster. Uh, Pachem itself has fewer than ten standard days until the barbarians arrive. Duray's high forehead gleamed in the candlelight. The business of the church is something beyond a mere daily imperative, my friend. I will make my visit on the Templar world brief, then join M. Seven in his effort of convincing the CEO not to listen to the Corps. Then I will return, Edward, and we will try to make some sense of this confused heresy. I followed the two of them out of the basilica, through a side door that led to a passageway behind the tall colonnades, left across an open courtyard. The rain had stopped and the air smelled fresh, down a stairway and through a narrow tunnel into, a papal, into the papal apartments. Members of the Swiss Guard snapped to attention as we came into the apartment's anteroom. The tall men were dressed in armour and yellow and blue striped pantaloons, although their ceremonial halberds were also false-quality energy weapons. One stepped forward and spoke softly to the Monsignor. Someone has just arrived at the main terminex to see you, M7. Me? Oh, someone has just arrived at the main terminex to see you, M7. Me? I had been listening to other voices in other rooms, the melodious rise and fall of oft-repeated prayers. I assumed it had to do with preparation for the Pope's burial. Yes, and M. Hunt, he says that it is urgent. Another minute and I would have seen him at Government House, I said. Why not have him join us here? Monsignor Edouard nodded and spoke softly to the Swiss guard, who whispered into an ornamental crest on his antique armour. The so-called Pope's Door, a small farcaster portal surrounded by intricate gold carvings of seraphim and cherubim, topped with a five-station bas-relief, illustrating 
Adam and Eve's fall from grace and expulsion from the garden, stood in the centre of a well-guarded room just off the Pope's private apartments. We waited there, our reflections wan and tired-looking in the mirrors on each wall. Leigh Hunt was, ex was escorted in by the priest who had led me to the basilica. Severn, cried Gladstone's favourite adviser, the CEO needs you at once. I was just going there, I said. It would, be cr it would be a criminal mistake if Gladstone allowed the Corps to build and use the death device. Hunt blinked, an almost comical reaction on that basset hound countenance. Do you know everything that happens, Severn? I had to laugh. A young child sitting unattended in a hollow pit sees much and understands very little. Still, he has the advantage of being able to change channels and turn the thing off when he grows tired of it. Hunt knew Monsignor Edouard from various state functions, and I introduced Father Paul de Ray of the Society of Jesus. De Ray? managed Hunt, his jaw almost hanging slack. It was the first time I had seen the adviser at a loss for words, and I rather enjoyed the sight. We'll explain later, I said, and shook the pe uh, and shook the priest's hand. Good luck on God's grove, de Ray. Don't be too long. An hour, promised the Jesuit. No longer. There is merely one piece of the puzzle I must find before speaking to the CEO. Please explain to her about the horror of the labyrinth. I will give her my own testimony later. It's possible that she'll be too busy to see me before you get there anyway, I said, but I'll do my best to play John the Baptist for you. Duray smiled. Just don't lose your head, my friend. He nodded, tapped in a transfer code on the archaic disk key panel, and disappeared through the portal. I bid farewell to Monsignor Edouard. We will get all this settled before the ouster wave gets this far. The old priest raised a hand and blessed me. Go with God, young man. I feel that dark times await us all, but that you will be especially burdened. I shook my head. I'm just an observer, Monsignor. I wait and watch and dream. Little burden there. Wait and watch and dream later. Lay Hunt said sharply. Her nibs want you within reach now, and I have a meeting to get back to. I looked at the little man. How did you find me? I asked needlessly. Farcasters were operated by the Corps, and the Corps worked with the hegemony authorities. The override card she gave you also makes it easier to keep track of your travels, Hunt said, his impatience audible. Right now we have an obligation to be where things are happening. Very well. I nodded at the Monsignor and his aide, beckoned to Hunt, and tapped in the three-digit code for Tau Seti Center, added two digits for the continent, three more for Government House, and added the final two numbers for the private Terminex there. The Farcaster's hum went up a notch on the scale. Its opaque surface seemed to shimmer with expectancy. I stepped through first, stepped aside to give Hunt room as he followed. We are not in the central government house Terminex. As far as I can tell, we are nowhere near government house. A second later, my senses total the input of sunlight, sky colour, gravity, distance to horizon, smells and feel of things, and decide that we aren't on Tau Ceti Centre. I would have jumped back through the portal then, but the Pope's door is small. Hunt is coming through. Leg, arm, shoulder, chest, head, second leg appearing. Excuse me. So I grab his wrist, pull him through, roughly say, oh, sorry, there's a line break there. <clears throat> sorry, there's a line break there. So I grab his wrist, pull him through roughly, say, something's wrong, and try to step back through, but too late. The frameless portal on this side shimmers, dilates to a circle the size of my fist, and is gone. Where the hell are we? demands Hunt. I look around and think, good question. We are in the country, on a hilltop. 
A road underfoot winds through vineyards, down, goes down a long hill through a wooded vale, and disappears around another hill a mile or two distant. It is very warm, and the air hums with the sounds of insects, but nothing larger than a bird moves in this vast panorama. Between bluffs to our right, a blue smear of water is visible, either in ocean or sea. High cirrus ripples overhead. The sun is just past the zenith. I see no houses, no technology more complicated than the vineyard rows and the stone and mud road underfoot. More importantly, the constant background buzz of the data sphere is gone. It is somewhat like sudden it is somewhat like suddenly hearing the absence of a sound one has been immersed in since infancy. It is startling, heart stopping, confusing, and a bit terrifying. Hunt staggers, claps his ears as if it is true sound he is missing, taps at his com log. God damn, he mutters. God damn my implants malfunctioning. Com logs out. No, I say. I believe we're beyond the data sphere. But even as I say this, I hear a deeper, softer hum, something far greater and far less accessible than the data sphere than the data sphere. The megasphere? The music of the spheres, I think, and smile. What the hell are you grinning about, Severn? Did you do this on purpose? No, I gave the proper codes for Government House. The total absence of panic in my voice is a kind of panic itself. What is it, then? That goddamn Pope's door? Did it do this? Some mouth or trick? No, I think not. The door didn't malfunction, Hunt. It brought us just where the Technocore wants us. The core? The what little colour left in that Bassett countenance quickly drains away as the CEO's aide realises who controls the Farcaster. Who controls all Farcasters. My God! My God! Hunt staggers to the side of the road and sits in the tall grass there. His suede executive suit and soft black shoes look out of place here. Where are we? he asks again. I take a deep breath. The air smells of fresh-turned soil, newly mown grass, road dust, and the sharp tinge of the sea. My guess is that we're on Earth, Hunt. Earth. The little man is staring straight ahead, focusing on nothing. Earth. Not New Earth, not Terra, not Earth 2, not... No, I say. Earth. Old Earth. Or its duplicate. Its duplicate. I go over and sit beside him. I pull a strand of grass and strip the lower part of its outer sheath. The grass tastes tart and familiar. You remember my report to Gladstone on, Hyper on the Hyperion Pilgrim stories? Braun Lamia's tale? She and my cybrid counterpart, the first Keats retrieval persona, travelled to what they thought was an old Earth duplicate. In the Hercules cluster, if I remember correctly. Hunt glances up, as if he can judge what I am saying by checking constellations. The blue above is greying slightly as the high cirrus spreads, spreads across the dome of sky. Hercules Cluster, he whispers. Why the Technocore built a duplicate, or what they're doing with it now, Braun didn't learn, I say. Either the first Keats Cybrid didn't know, or he wasn't saying. Wasn't saying, nods Hunt. He shakes his head. All right, how the hell do we get out of here? Gladstone needs me. She can't... There are dozens of vital decisions to be made in the next few hours. He jumps to his feet, runs to the centre of the road, a study in purposeful energy. I chew on the stalk of grass. My guess is that we don't get out of here. Hunt comes at me as if he is going to assault me then and there. Are you insane? No way out? That's nuts. Why would the Corps do that? He pauses, looks down at me. I don't want you talking to her. You know something the Corps can't risk her learning. 
Perhaps. Leave him! Let me go back! He screams at the sky. No one answers. Far out across the vineyard, a large black bird takes flight. I think it is a crow. I remember the name of the extinct species as if from a dream. I remember the name of the extinct species as if from a dream. After a moment, Hunt gives up on addressing the sky and paces back and forth on the stone road. Come on, maybe there's a Terminex wherever this thing goes. Perhaps, I say, breaking off the stalk of grass to get at the sweet, dry upper half. But which way? Hunt turns, looks at the road disappearing around hills in both directions, turns again. We came through the portal looking this way, he points. The road goes downhill into a narrow wood. How far? I ask. God damn it, does it matter? he barks. We have to get somewhere. I resist the impulse to smile. All right. I stand and brush off my trousers, feeling the fierce sunlight on my forehead and face. After the incense-laden darkness of the basilica, it is a shock. The air is very hot, and my clothing is already damp with sweat. Hunt starts walking vigorously down the hill, his fists clenched, his doleful expression ameliorated for once by a stronger expression. Sheer resolve. Walking slowly, in no hurry, still chewing on my stalk of sweet grass, eyes half closed with weariness, I follow him. Colonel Fedman Kassad screamed and attacked the Shrike. The surreal, out-of-time landscape, a minimalist stage designer's version of the Valley of the Time Tombs, molded in plastic and set in a gel of viscous air, seemed to vibrate with the vo to the violence of Kassad's rush. For an instant there had been a mirror image scattering of Shrikes, Shrikes throughout the valley, spread across the barren plain. But with Kassad's shout, these resolved themselves into, these resolved themselves to the single monster, and now it moved, four arms unfolding and extending, curving to greet the colonel's rush with a hearty hug of blades and thorns. Kassad did not know if the energy skin suit he wore, Moneta's gift, would protect him or serve him well in combat. It had years, it had years before, when he and Moneta had attacked two dropships worth of ouster commandos, but time had been on their si but time had been on their side then. The Shrike had been, had frozen and unfrozen the flow of moments like a bored observer playing with a hollow pit remote control. Now they were outside time, and the Shrike was the enemy, not some terrible patron. Kassad shouted and put his head down and attacked, no longer aware of Moneta watching, nor of the impossible tree of thorns rising into the clouds with its terrible, impaled audience, nor even aware of himself except as a fighting tool, an instrument of revenge. The Shrike did not disappear in its usual manner, did not cease being there to suddenly be here. Instead, it crouched and opened its arms wider. Its finger blades caught the light of the violent sky. The Shrike's metal teeth glistened in what might have been a smile. Kassad was angry. He was not insane. Rather than rush into that embrace of death, he threw himself aside at the last instant, rolling on arm and shoulder, and kicking out at the monster's lower leg, below the cluster of thorn blades at the knee joint, above a similar array on the ankle. If he could get it down... It was like kicking at a pipe embedded in half a click of concrete. The blow would have broken Kassad's own leg if the skin suit had not acted as armor and shock absorber. 
The shrike moved, quickly but not impossibly, the two right arms swinging up and down and around in a blur, ten finger blades carving soil and stone in surgical furrows, arm thorns sending sparks flying as the hands continued upward, slicing air with an audible rush. Kassad was out of range, continuing his roll, coming to his feet again, crouching, his own arms tensed, palms flat, energy-suited fingers rigid and extended. Single combat, thought Fedman Kassad, the most honorable sacrament in the new Bushido. The shrike fainted with its right arms again, swung the lower left arm around and up with a sweeping blow violent enough to shatter Kassad's ribs and scoop his heart out. Kassad blocked the right arm faint with his left forearm, feeling the skin suit flex and batter bone as the steel and axe force of the shrike's blow struck home. The left arm killing blow, he stopped with his right hand on the monster's wrist, just above the corsage of curved spikes there. Incredibly, he slowed the blow's momentum enough that, scal that scalpel-sharp finger blades were now scraping against his skin suit field rather than splintering ribs. Kassad was almost lifted off the ground with the effort of restraining that rising claw. Only the downward thrust of the shrike's first feint kept the colonel from flying backward. Sweat poured freely under the skin suit, muscles flexed and ached and threatened to rip in that interminable twenty seconds of struggle before the shrike brought its fourth arm into play, slashing downward at Kassad's straining leg. Kassad screamed as the skin suit field ripped, flesh tore, and at least one finger blade sliced close to bone. He kicked out with his other leg, released the thing's wrist, and rolled frantically away. The shrike swung twice, the second blow whistling millimeters from Kassad's moving ear, but then jumped back itself, crouching, moving to its right. Kassad got to his left knee, almost fell, then staggered to his feet, hopping slightly to keep his balance. The pain roared in his ears and filled the universe with red light, but even as he grimaced and staggered, close to fainting from the shock of it, he could feel the skin suit closing on the wound, serving as both tourniquet and compress. He could feel the blood on his lower leg, but it was no longer flowing freely, and the pain was manageable, almost as if the skin suit carried medpack injectors like his force battle armor. The Shrike rushed him. Kassad kicked once, twice, aiming for and finding the smooth bit of chrome carapace beneath the chest spike. It was like kicking the hull of a torch ship, but the Shrike seemed to pause, stagger, step back. Kassad stepped forward, planted his weight, struck twice where the creature's heart should be with a closed-fist blow that would have shattered tempered ceramic, ignored the pain from his fist, swiveled, and slammed a straight-armed, open-palmed blow into the creature's muzzle, just above the teeth. Any human being would have heard the sound of his nose being broken and felt the explosion of bone and cartilage being driven into his brain. The Shrike snapped at Kassad's wrist, missed, swung four hands at Kassad's head and shoulders. Panting, pouring sweat and blood under his quicksilver armor, Kassad spun to his right once, twice, and came around with a killing blow to the back of the creature's short neck. The noise of the impact echoed in the frozen valley like the sound of an axe thrown from miles on high into the heart of a metal redwood. The Shrike stumbled forward, rolled onto its back like some steel crustacean. It had gone down. Kassad stepped forward, still crouched, still cautious, but not cautious enough as the Shrike's armored foot, claw, whatever the hell it was, caught the back of Kassad's ankle and half sliced, half kicked him off his, feast, off his feet. Colonel Kassad felt the pain, knew that his Achilles tendon had been severed, tried to roll away, but the creature was throwing itself up and sideways on him, spikes and thorns and blades coming at Kassad's ribs and face and eyes. 
grimacing with pain, arching in a vain attempt to throw the monster off. Kassad blocked some blows, saved his eyes, and felt other blades slam home in his upper arms, chest, and belly. The shrike hovered closer and opened its mouth. Kassad stared up into row upon row of steel teeth set in a metal lamprey's hollow orifice of a mouth. Red eyes filled his sight through vision already tinged with blood. Kassad got the base of his palm under the shrike's jaw and tried to find leverage. It was like trying to lift a mountain of sharp scrap with no fulcrum. The shrike's finger blades continued to tear at Kassad's flesh. The thing opened its mouth and tilted its head until, feet, until teeth filled Kassad's field of vision from ear to ear. The monster had no breath, but the heat from its interior stank of sulfur and heated iron filings. Kassad had no defense left. When the thing snapped its jaws shut, it would take the flesh and skin of Kassad's face off it would take the flesh and skin of Kassad's face off to the bone. Suddenly Moneta was there, shouting in that place where sound did not carry, grabbing the shrike by its ruby-faceted eyes, skin-suited fingers arching like talons, her boot planted firmly on its carapace below the back spike, pulling, pulling. The shrike's arms snapped backward, as double-jointed as some nightmare crab. Finger blades raked Moneta, and she fell away, but not before Kassad rolled, scrambled, felt the pain but ignored it, and leaped to his feet, dragging Moneta with him as he retreated across the sand and frozen rock. For a second, their skin suits merged as it had when they were making love, and Kassad felt her flesh next to his, felt their blood and sweat mingling, and heard the joined poundings of their hearts. "'Kill it!' Moneta whispered urgently, pain audible even through that sub-vocal medium. "'I'm trying! I'm trying!' The shrike was on its feet, three meters of chrome and blades and other people's pain. It showed no damage. Someone's blood ran in narrow rivulets down its wrists and carapace. Its mindless grin seemed wider than before. Kassad separated his skin suit from Moneta's, lowered her gently to a boulder, although he sensed that he had been hurt worse that he had been hurt worse than she. This was not her fight. Not yet. He moved between his love and the shrike. Kassad hesitated, hearing a faint but rising susurration as if from rising surf on an, in on an invisible shore. He glanced up, never fully removing his gaze from the slowly advancing shrike, and realized that it was a shouting from the thorn tree far behind the monster. The crucified people there, small dabs of color hanging from the metal thorns and cold branches, were making some noise other than the subliminal moans of pain Kassad had heard earlier. They were cheering. Kassad turned his attention, returned his attention to the shrike as the thing began to circle again. Kassad felt the pain and weakness in his almost severed heel. His right foot was useless, unable to bear weight, and he half hopped, half swiveled with one hand on the boulder to keep his body between the shrike and Moneta. The distant cheering seemed to stop as if in a gasp. The shrike ceased being there and came into existence here, next to Kassad, on top of Kassad, its arms already around him in a terminal hug, thorns and blades already impinging. The shrike's eyes blazed with light, its jaws opened again. Kassad shouted in pure rage and defiance and struck at it. Father Paul Duray stepped through the Pope's door to God's Grove without incident. From the incense-laden dimness of the papal apartments, he suddenly found himself in rich sunlight with a lemon sky above and green leaves all around. 
The Templars were waiting as he stepped down from the private Farcaster portal. Duray could see the edge of the Weirwood platform, five meters to his right, and beyond it, nothing. Or, rather, everything, as the treetop world of God's Grove stretched great distances to the horizon, the rooftop of leaves shimmering and moving like a living ocean. Duray knew that he was high on the world tree, the greatest and holiest of all the trees the Templars held sacred. The Templars greeting him were important in the complicated hierarchy of the Brotherhood of the Muir, but served as mere guides now, leading him from the portal platform to a vine-strewn elevator which rose through upper levels and terraces where few non-Templars had ever ascended, and then out again and up along a st and up along a staircase bound by the railing bound by a railing of the finest muir wood, spiraling skyward around a trunk that narrowed from its two hundred meter base to less than eight meters across here near its top. The weirwood platform was exquisitely carved. Its railings showed a delicate tracery of hand-carved vines, posts and balusters, boasted the faces of gnomes, wood sprites, fairies, and other spirits, and the table and chairs which Duray now approached were carved from the same piece of wood as the circular platform itself. Two men awaited him. The first was the one Duray expected, true voice of the world tree, high priest of the Muir, spokesman of the Templar Brotherhood, Sek Hardeen. The second man was a surprise. Duray noted the red robe, a red the color of arterial blood, with black ermine trim, the heavy Lucian body covered by that robe, the face all jowls and fat bisected by a formidable beak of a nose, two tiny eyes lost above fat cheeks, two pudgy hands with a black or red ring on each finger. Duray knew that he was looking at the bishop of the Church of the Final Atonement, the high priest of the Shrike cult. The Templar rose to his almost two-meter height and offered his hand. Father Duray, we are most pleased that you could join us. Duray shook hands, thinking as he did so how much like a root the Templar's hand was, with its long, tapering, yellowish-brown fingers. The true voice of the world tree wore the same hooded robe that Het Mastine had worn, its rough brown and green threads in sharp contrast to the brilliance of the bishop's garb. "'Thank you for seeing me on such notice, M. Hardeen,' asked du said Duray. The true voice was the spiritual leader of millions of the followers of the Muir, but Duray knew that Templars disliked titles or honorifics in conversation. Duray nodded in the direction of the bishop. Your Excellency, I had no idea that I would have the honor of being in your presence. The Shrike cult bishop nodded almost imperceptibly. I was visiting. M. Hardeen suggested that it might be of some small benefit if I attended this meeting. I am pleased to meet you, Father Duray. We have heard much about you in, a, in the past few years. The Templar gestured toward a seat across the Muirwood table from the... Uh, across the Muirwood... Ah, uh, let's try this sentence again. <laughs> Blech. The the Templar gestured toward a seat across the Muirwood table from the two of them, and Duray sat, folding his hands on the polished tabletop, thinking furiously even as he pretended to inspect the beautiful grain in the wood. Half the security forces in the web were searching for the Shrike cult bishop. His presence suggested complications far beyond those the Jesuit had been prepared to deal with. Interesting, is it not? said the bishop, that three of humankind's most profound religions are represented here today. Yes, said Duray, profound but hardly representational of the beliefs of the majority. Out of almost a hundred and fifty billion souls, the Catholic Church claims fewer than a million. The shrine... <clears throat> uh, the Church of the Final Atonement, perhaps five to ten million. 
Uh, did I say billion or million a minute ago? Okay, let's uh, let's try Duray's bit again. I'm sorry. Yes, said Duray. Profound, but hardly representational of the beliefs of the majority. Out of almost a hundred and fifty billion souls, the Catholic Church claims fewer than a million. The Shri, uh, the Church of the Final Atonement, perhaps five to ten million. And how many Templars are there, M. Hardeen? Twenty-three million, the Templar said softly. Many others support our ecological causes and might even wish to join, but the Brotherhood is not open to outsiders. The bishop rubbed one of his chins. His skin was very pale, and he squinted as if he were not used to daylight. The Zen Gnostics claim forty billion followers, he rumbled. But what kind of religion is that, eh? No churches, no priests, no holy books, no concept of sin. Duray smiled. It seems to be the belief most attuned to the times, and has been for many generations now. Bah! The bishop slapped his hand down on the table, and Duray winced as he heard the metal of his rings strike Muirwood. "'How is it that you know who I am?' asked Paul Duray. The Templar lifted his head just enough that Duray could see sunlight on his nose, cheeks, and the long line of chin within the shadows of the cowl. He did not speak. "'We chose you,' growled the bishop. "'You and the other pilgrims.' "'You being the Shrike Church,' said Duray. "'The bishop frowned at that phrase, but nodded without speaking. "'Why the riots?' asked Duray. "'Why the disturbances now that the hegemony is threatened?' "'When the bishop rubbed his chin, Red and black stones glinted in the evening light. Beyond him, a million leaves rustled in a breeze which brought the scent of rain-moistened vegetation. The final days are here, priest. The prophecies given to us by the Avatar centuries ago are unfolding before our eyes. What you call riots are the first death throes of a society which deserves to die. The days of atonement are upon us, and the Lord of Pain soon will walk among us. The Lord of Pain, repeated Duray, the Shrike. The Templar made an ameliorating gesture with one hand, as if he were trying to take some of the edge off of the bishop's statement. Father Duray, we are aware of your miraculous rebirth. Not a miracle, said Duray, the whim of a parasite called a cruciform. Again, the gesture with the long, yellow-brown fingers. However you see it, Father, the Brotherhood rejoices that you are with us once again. Please go ahead with the query you mentioned when you called earlier. Duray rubbed his palms against the wood of the chair, glanced at the bishop sitting across from him in all of his red and black bulk. Your groups have been working together for some time, haven't they? said Duray, the Templar Brotherhood and the Shrike Church. The Church of the Final Atonement, the bishop said in a bass growl. Duray nodded. Why, what brings you together in this? The true voice of the world tree leaned forward so that shadow filled his cowl again. You must see, Father, that the prophecies of the Church of the Final Atonement touch upon our mission from the Muir. Only these prophecies have held the key to what punishment must befall humankind for, de for killing its own world. Humankind alone didn't destroy Old Earth, said Duray. It was a computer error in the Kiev team's attempt to create a mini black hole. The Templar shook his head. It was human arrogance, 
he said softly, the same arrogance which has caused our race to destroy all species that might even hope to evolve to intelligence some day. The, Senesha, the Seneshai Aluit on Hebron, the Zeppelins of Quirrell, the Marsh Centaurs of Garden, and the Great Apes of Old Earth. Yes, said Duray, mistakes have been made, but that shouldn't sentence humankind to death, should it? The sentence has been handed down by a power far greater than ourselves, rumbled the bishop. The prophecies are precise and explicit. The day of final atonement must come. All who have inherited the sins of Adam and Kiev must suffer the consequences of murdering their homeworld, of extinguishing other species. The Lord of Pain has been freed from the bonds of time to render this final judgment. There is no escaping his wrath. There is no avoiding atonement. A power far greater than us has said this. It is true, said Secardine. The prophecies have come to us, spoken to the true voices over the generations. Humankind is doomed, but with their doom will come a new flowering for pristine environments in all parts of what is now the hegemony. Trained in Jesuit logic, devoted to the evolutionary theology of Teilhard's Teilhard de Chardin, de Chardin, Father Paul de Ray was nonetheless tempted to say, But who the hell cares if the flowers bloom, if no one is around to see them, to smell them? Instead, he said, Have you considered that these prophecies were not divine revelations, but merely manipulations from some secular power? The Templar sat back as if slapped, but the bishop leaned forward and curled two Lucian fists, which could have crushed, crushed Duray's skull with a single blow. Heresy! Whoever dares deny the truth of the revelations must die! What power could do this? managed the true voice of the world tree. What power other than the Muir's absolute could enter our minds and hearts? Duray gestured toward the sky. Every world in the web has been joined through the Technocore's data sphere for generations. Most people of influence carry Comlog extension implants for ease of accessing. Do you not, M. Hardeen? The Templar said nothing, but Duray saw the small twitch of fingers, as if the man were going to pat his chest and upper arm where the micro-implants had lain for decades. The Technocore has created a transcendent intelligence, continued Duray. It taps incredible amounts of energy, is able to move backward and forward in time, and is not motivated by human concerns. One of the goals of a sizable percentage of the core personalities was to eliminate humankind. Indeed, the big mistake of the Kiev team may have been deliberately executed by the AIs involved in that experiment. What you hear as prophecies may be the voice of this deus ex machina whispering through the data sphere. The Shrike may be, may be here not to make humankind atone for its sins, but merely to slaughter human men, women, and children for this machine personality's own goals. The bishop's heavy face was as red as his robe. His fists pummeled the table, as he struggled, and he struggled to his feet. The Templar laid a hand on the bishop's arm and restrained him, somehow pulled him back to his seat. Where have you heard of this idea? Sec Hardeen asked Duray. From those on the pilgrimage who have access to the core, and from others. The bishop shook a fist in Duray's direction. But you yourself have been touched by the Avatar, not once, but twice. He has granted you a form of immortality so you can see what he has in store for the chosen people, those who prepare atonement before the final days are upon us. 
the shrike gave me pain said duray pain and suffering beyond imagination i have met the thing twice and i know in my heart that it is neither divine nor diabolical but merely some organic machine from a terrible future bah the bishop made a dismissive gesture folded his arms and stared out over the low balcony at nothing the templar appeared shaken after a moment he raised his head and said softly you had a question for me duray took a breath i did and sad news i'm afraid true voice of the tree het mastin is dead we know said the templar duray was surprised he could not imagine how they could receive that information but it did not matter now what i need to know is why did he go on the pilgrimage what was the mission that he did not live to see completed each of us told our our story hetmastine did not yet somehow i feel that his fate held the key to many mysteries the bishop looked back at deray and sneered we need tell you nothing priest of a dead religion sec hardine sat silent a long moment before responding a mastine volunteered to be the one to carry the word of the muir to hyperion the prophecy has lain in the roots of our belief for centuries that when the troubled times came a true voice of the tree would be called upon to take a tree ship to the holy world to see it destroyed there and then to have it reborn carrying the message of atonement and the muir so Hetmastin knew that the tree shipping Jasil would be destroyed in orbit? Yes, it was foretold. And he and the single energy binder egg from the ship were to fly a new tree ship? Yes, said the Templar almost inaudibly, a tree of atonement which the Avatar would provide. Duray sat back, nodded. A tree of atonement, the thorn tree. Hetmastine was psychically injured when the Yggdrasil was destroyed. Then he was taken to the Valley of the Time Tombs and shown the Shrike's thorn tree. But he was not ready or able to do it. The thorn tree is a structure of death, of suffering, of pain. Hetmastine was not prepared to captain it. Or perhaps he refused. In any case, he fled and died. I thought as much, but I had no oh, but I had no idea what fate the Shrike had offered him. What are you talking about? snapped the bishop. The Tree of Atonement is described in the prophecies. It will accompany the Avatar in his final harvest. Mastine would have been prepared and honoured to captain it through space and time. Paul de Ray shook his head. We have answered your question, asked M. Hardine. Yes. Then you must answer ours, said the bishop. What has happened to the mother? what mother the mother of our salvation the bride of atonement the one you called brawn lamia duray thought back trying to rem trying to remember the consul's taped summaries of the tales the pilgrims had told on the way to hyperion brawn had been pregnant with the first keats cybrid's child the Shrike Temple on Lucis had saved her from the mob, included her in the, sh in the pilgrimage. She had said something in her story about the Shrike cultists treating her with reverence. Duray tried to fit all this into the confused mosaic of what he had already learned. He could not. He was too tired. And, he thought, too stupid after this so-called resurrection. He was not and never would be the intellectual Paul de Ray had once had been. Braun was unconscious, he said, evidently taken by the Shrike. 
and attached to some thing, some cable. Her mental state was the equivalent of brain death, but the fetus was alive and healthy. And the persona she carried? asked the bishop, his voice tense. Duray remembered what Severn had told him about the death of that persona in the megasphere. Evidently, these two did not know about the second Keats persona, the Severn personality that at this moment was warning Gladstone about the dangers of the core proposal. Duray shook his head. He was very tired. I don't know about the persona she carried in the Shroon Loop he said. The cable, the thing the Shrike attached to her, seemed to plug into the neural socket like a cortical shunt. The bishop nodded, evidently satisfied. The prophecies are proceed apace. You have served your purpose as messenger, Duray. I must leave now. The big man nod stood, nodded toward the true voice of the world tree, and swept across the platform and down the stairs toward the elevator and Terminex. Duray sat across from the Templar in silence for several minutes. The sound of leaves blowing and the gentle rocking of the treetop platform was marvelously lulling, inviting the Jesuit to doze off. Above them, the sky was fading through delicate saffron shades as the world of God's Grove turned into twilight. Your statement about a deus ex machina misleading us for generations through false prophecies was a terrible heresy, the Templar said at last. Yes, but terrible heresies have proven to be grim truths many times before in the longer history of my church, Secardine. If you were a Templar, I could have you put to death, the hooded figure said softly. Duray sighed. At his age, in this situation, and as tired as he was, the thought of death created no fear in his heart. He stood and bowed slightly. I need to go, Sek Hardeen. I apologize if anything I said offended you. It is a confused and confusing time. The best lack all conviction, he thought, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Duray turned and walked to the edge of the platform, and stopped. The staircase was gone. Thirty vertical meters and fifteen horizontal meters of air separated him from the next lower platform where the elevator waited. The world tree dropped away a kilometer or more into the leafy depths beneath him. Duray and the true voice of the tree were isolated here on the highest platform. Duray walked to a nearby railing, raised his suddenly sweaty face to the evening breeze, and noticed the first of the stars emerging from the ultramarine sky. "'What's going on, Sekhardine?' The robed and cowled figure at the table was wrapped in darkness. "'In eighteen minutes, standard, and the world of Heaven's Gate will fall to the ousters. "'Our prophecies say that it will be destroyed. "'Certainly its Farcaster will and its Fatline transmitters, "'and to all intents and purposes that world will have ceased to exist. "'Precisely one standard hour late. The skies of God's Grove will be alight from the fusion fires of ouster warships. Our prophecies say that all of the Brotherhood who remain, and anyone else, although all hegemony citizens have long since been evacuated by Farcaster, will perish. And the world burned. Oh yeah, that's a that's a couple chucks. Not a good sign. Uh, hopefully everyone comes out okay there. Uh, our prophecies say that all of the Brotherhood who remain will perish. Duray walked slowly back to the table. It's imperative that I cast to Tau Seti Center, he said. Seven. 
someone is waiting for me. I have to speak to CEO Gladstone. No, said true voice of the world tree, Sec Hardeen. We will wait. We will see if the prophecies are correct. The Jesuit clenched his fists in frustration, fighting the surge of violent emotion that made him want to strike the robed figure. Duray closed his eyes and said two Hail Marys. It didn't help. Please, he said, the prophecies will be confirmed or denied whether I am here or not, and then it will be too late. The force torch ships will blow the singularity sphere, and the farcasters will be gone, will be cut off from the web for years. Billions of lives may depend upon my immediate return to Tau City Center. The Templar folded his arms so that his long-fingered hands disappeared in the folds of his robe. "'We will wait,' he said. "'All the things predicted will come to pass. "'In minutes the Lord of Pain will be loosed on those in the web. "'I do not believe in the bishop's faith "'that those who have sought atonement will be spared. "'We are better off here, Father Duray, "'where the end will be swift and painless.' Duray searched his tired mind for something decisive to say, to do. Nothing occurred to him. He sat at the table and stared at the cowled and silent figure across from him. Above them, the stars emerged in their fiery multitudes. The world forest of God's Grove rustled a final time to the evening breeze and seemed to hold its breath in anticipation. Paul Duray closed his eyes, and prayed. And with that, I've got to call it. Uh, thanks to everyone who tuned in. Uh, I know a bit of a shorter one this go-round. Um, we will definitely continue this next week one way or the other. Um, <laughs> one way or another. Yes. Okay, man. Don't lose your page like this. It's no need. You are damaged, sir. Okay. Anyway, uh, yeah, got to run. Uh, had some pretty interesting revelations this go around. The uh, it certainly looks as though our good friends, the Technocore, are. Uh, endeavoring to uh, wipe humanity out. They're being pretty thorough, it looks like, um, by using, I guess, the local equivalent of neutron bombs and, uh, and then uh, putting people into the, uh, into the labyrinthine worlds, the labyrinths, which, as we've learned, uh, are filled with death already or will be filled with death, time wonkery makes this a little tricky. So, <laughs> anyway, um, thanks to everyone who tuned in. Um, to anyone tuning in for the first time, uh, after the fact, uh, hi. I do these mostly like clockwork every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, uh, starting at about noon Eastern Standard Time, or U.S. East Coast Time. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Um, you can find all the previous installments, uh, in playlists, mostly, mostly in playlists, on my YouTube channel, which should be, uh, linked in the stream description. And, um, yeah, so I do read other things throughout the week. On Mondays, it's typically uh, Mecha Mondays, where I do something, read something giant robot related or Mecha adjacent. Wednesdays are typically kind of a float day where I sort of do whatever, though I have plans uh, for some stuff I want to do, at least for a little while. Um, a thematic change uh, or a sticking to a theme. And uh, then Wednesdays are, uh, Fridays rather, are free read Fridays where I read short stories and indeed entire novels allowed, uh, typically of a science fiction event. Um, it's where uh, most of my 
entertaining little pulp readings from, say, astounding science fiction from, you know, the 30s comes from, the 40s and 50s and 60s, as well as a couple of readings from Interzone um, magazine, which may or may not still be in syndication in one capacity or another. Um, at any rate, um, thanks again for tuning in. Um, stay safe, stay sane, and uh, be decent to each other. See you all next time. Bye.